Hi, and welcome back to the Taco Share YouTube channel. Today, I am interviewing Brooke uh, about Asian carp. Brooke, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, my name is Brooke Schreier. I am the assistant coordinator with the Invading Species Awareness Program, which is a program out of the Ontario Federation of Agriculture Hunters. It has actually been around since 1992. Awesome, thanks. How do you differ an Asian carp from a non-native carp in Ontario? It's a great question. Um, so there are four species of Asian carps, and you can actually see the four different species of Asian carps behind us here. So you've got the grass carp, the black carp, the silver carp, and the big head carp. So in Ontario right now, there's actually only one of these species, and that's actually the, the grass carp right here. And they're not yet established in Ontario's waters, but they are present. And we've found approximately 34 since 2012. That's when the, the program, the Asian Carp program with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans first started. And you know, when you're really trying to tell the difference between the species, one of the main things you're looking for is actually this, uh, this dorsal fin right here. So on the grass carp, it's very narrow, whereas on the non-native common carp, or Supernus carpio, which is uh, another non-native, but it's not invasive per se, um, its dorsal fin is much longer. It's about a third of its total body length. Beyond that, you also have eye placement, which is a big characteristic to look for. So on the grass carp, the eye placement is actually in line with the mouth opening, whereas on the common carp, it's above the mouth opening. And then the common carp also has a sucker downturned mouth, and it has barbels, so there's whiskers on the side of its mouth, whereas grass carp has uh, a jawed mouth and does not have barbels. So those are the key things to look for. But that being said, there are some similarities. Grass carp have that cross-hatch pattern of scales, uh, very large scales, which are very similar to the common carp. And that's why people mistakenly identify common carp as grass carp quite frequently, because they see it in the water, they see a big fish, large scales, and they think maybe that's a grass carp, and then they report it to us, but then it always ends up being a common carp. Right, okay. So this here is a, is a grass carp. So this is the one that is the greatest and most imminent threat to Ontario's waters today. This is the one that has been found in Ontario's waters. And you know, one of the key characteristics that you're gonna look for or key identifying features is that dorsal fin here. So as you can see, it's quite narrow, just a few inches wide. This is obviously a smaller specimen, but it, it is much more narrow than the non-native uh, European carp. On the European carp, you have the dorsal fin, which starts about here and goes uh, closer to the, the caudal fin or the tail fin. So that's one of the key identifying features. Another thing to look for is actually uh, in the face, so the eye placement. If you were to draw an imaginary line down the center of its body, you would see that this eye is actually in the center of that, that body, or that line, sorry. Whereas the mouth here is a jawed mouth uh, and does not have barbels. Whereas the common carp, the most common look-alike species that is, a, that is reported to us, has barbels or whiskers and a downturned sucker mouth. So those are some of the key things to look for. And this one here, this one's actually the, the silver carp. So this one and the big head look quite similar. The big head, uh, you can probably guess, gets quite a bit larger. The average size of these guys in the Illinois is about five to seven pounds. Um, but this guy's actually known as the, the jumping fish. So if you've ever gone on YouTube and looked up, you know, jumping uh, carp, this is that species which, uh, when it's disturbed in the water, will leap uh, up to about three to five meters out of uh, the water and can cause some serious damage to your, your watercrafts or to your person. And in terms of its uh, key identifying features, it actually has uh, much finer scales than you see on the, the grass and the, and the uh, black carp. But still, it has that very narrow dorsal fin as I identified on the grass carp. And in terms of its eye placement, whereas on the grass carp, it's in line with that uh, lateral line, on this guy, the eye is actually below it. So young kids will often think that the fish is upside down, uh, when in reality, that is literally where their eye placement is. It's much lower on their head. And they also have a jawed mouth without barbels. Um, and this one's actually a, a slightly upturned mouth. Um, which is, again, in contrast to the common carp or our non-native species that we have here in Ontario that has a downward sucker mouth with those barbels. So, how big can Asian carp get? Pretty massive. Bigger than basically any native species, most species that we have in Ontario. Um, the grass carp here can actually kind of max out at around six feet. So, approximately from here to the end of the table there. And they've been reported uh, at over 100 pounds. So they're, they're very large species of, of fish, and that's why they're able to dominate ecosystems so well. What do Asian carp eat? Yeah, so that's actually the reason why they're brought here in the first place. So some people don't know that, but these four species of fish were actually brought to North America specifically because of their diets. So they were introduced to aquaculture farms uh, back in the 60s and 70s, where the farmers were actually looking to control various things within the water bodies. So grass carp, you can probably guess, it's herbivorous, so it feeds on aquatic vegetation. 
You've got black carp, which is actually a mollusca borer, so it feeds on mollusks. Uh, so something like a native clam it might consume. It's got these large pharyngeal teeth, is what they're called, in the back of its head. They're almost like human molars. And they use that to crush things like clams. Then you've got the silver carp and the big head carp, which are, are both planktivorous. And so the uh, silver carp primarily feeds on uh, phytoplankton, whereas the big head carp is more so, uh, you know, eat, eats zooplankton more than anything. And they actually have gill ringers, so they'll, they'll feed on you know, the bottom of the food chain, just like a zebra mussel, right? Zebra mussels, that's one of the largest impacts, is that they filter feed. And that's essentially what these guys are doing as well. So what's interesting about that, between the four species, is that none of them are necessarily competing with each other for their food sources, right? So they're able to coexist. They compete for space, but they don't really compete for food resources. So this plays into the last question a little bit. But how do Asian carp affect the ecosystem and why are they invasive? So they're invasive because, first of all, where they've been introduced, at least anecdotally down in the US, so the Illinois uh, River watershed as well as the Mississippi, they make up about 90% of the biomass or, or fish species uh, in, that, in those areas. So 9 out of 10 fish are an Asian carp uh, species. So they grow quickly, they, within the first year of life, will actually outgrow the largest mouth size of native predatory fish. So a muskie, for example, or a pike, within the first year of its life, they will not be able to consume that fish anymore, which then means that the only predators they then have are larger animals, uh, maybe like minks or uh, you know, ospreys or, or humans. So you know, they're, they grow quickly, they reproduce quickly. One female going through a reproductive cycle can lay approximately two million eggs. Uh, so even if there's a, you know, only a small success rate or retention rate in those eggs, that's still a huge amount of eggs that are potentially growing up to be an adult. Now that being said, the impacts on the ecosystems that they have, well as I said, these two are, are planktivorous, so they're feeding on the bottom of the food chain, that plankton which is so vital for all of our native species and their young life stages. You know, you've got the black carp which is going to impact uh, loss of populations, including our native clams, which have already been decimated by the introduction of zebra mussels back in the early 90s, right? And then finally, grass carp, well, you're talking about threatening wetlands, right? Uh, Ontario has many beautiful wetlands that harbor all sorts of life, like the waterfowl as well as so many other species. And these things will consume about 40% of their weight every single day in aquatic vegetation, thus clearing out uh, vital wetlands and aquatic plants. Wow. So where are Asian carp found in Ontario? Well, so we actually have this really handy dandy map right here, which we can kind of point to. So, as I said, grass carp is the one species that has been detected in uh, our waters. So they have been found you know, in Prince Edward County, in Lake Ontario. They've been found just off the Welling Canal in between uh, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. They've been found in you know, eastern Lake Erie. They've been found towards Point Pelee, which is in the west end of Lake Erie. And then there have also been some captures kind of outside of Sarnia, uh, at the mouth of Lake Huron. So they have been found in three of the Great Lakes. Um, but that being said, as I said, they're not established. They're not going through any sort of reproductive cycles as of right now. And we're very fortunate because we have the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and their Asian carp crew, which have been uh, working since 2012 to nail down where these populations are potentially you know, uh, going to start reproducing in Ontario if that were to happen. Um, so they monitor each of the major tributaries within Ontario every year, looking for eggs and looking for possible grass carps. So they use uh, various methods to try to find those fish, but when they do, they are moving through the water. Awesome. Should new and novice anglers worry about Asian carp? I think all Ontarians should worry about Asian carp, and the reason being is that, you know, we kind of, uh, you know, have a, a very thriving economy within, you know, with the Great Lakes Basin around us because of the Great Lakes. Yeah. Shipping, uh, angling, you know, all these recreational industries. You know, they account for about $14 billion to Ontario's economy every single year. And these Asian carps are a threat, a direct threat to that economy. They're a threat to ecotourism, they're a threat to our native fish species as an extension, they're a threat to commercial fishing, they're a threat to recreational uh, angling. You name it, they're, they're a threat to it. So I think all Ontarians should be concerned, but especially uh, new and upcoming anglers, I think they should learn uh, basic identification skills so that if they catch something, they happen to catch something, they don't know what it is, you know, learn how to identify it, and most importantly, learn how to report it. If you suspect that you've captured an Asian carp, or a round goby, or another, another invasive uh, fish species, or even seen another invasive species, they should be calling the, the invading species hotline, which is 1-800-563-7711, or they can report online at www.eddmaps.org. 
Awesome. So we've touched on this a little bit, um, but how would the introduction of Asian carp affect fishing in Ontario? Yeah, so unfortunately, you know, if these species were to become established, I think what you would see is, uh, especially in the, the near shore areas, many of the fish, fish species that we like to, to fish for, you know, our basses, our perches, our those types of, you know, panfish, I think many of them would be uh, out-competed for, for resources. Many of their their areas where they will seek shelter or they'll, they'll use those areas for predation, you know, seeking food uh, or cover will be gone as a result of something like the, the grass carp. So I think angling in Ontario would fundamentally change because it wouldn't be replacing our sports fishery with another uh, you know, sports fish. It would be replacing our, our you know, the fish that we love to catch in Ontario that I've loved to catch since I was a young kid. You know, your, your, your large mouth, your small mouth, your walleye, your, your perch, with something that you're probably not gonna catch on a, on a hook. Uh, we have had you know, a few reports of these fish being captured with conventional means, but by and large, they're just not going to eat what you're offering, right? They're not going to bite your rapala. They're not going to, you know, go after your spinner bait. They're, they're eating vegetation, they're eating mollusks, and they're eating phytoplankton and zooplankton. So, four things which I don't know about you, but I've never used uh, for yeah. angling, angling purposes. So, as a result, again, you're going to be removing fish, which people love to fish for, but you're not replacing them with fish that anybody will be able to really fish for. Mm -hmm. So, it'll have fundamental changes to our, you know, the angling industry and just people who want to get into fishing. Right. So I know we've touched on this a little bit, but what's being done to stop the spread of Asian carp in Ontario? Sure. And um, what can we do to stop the spread of Asian carp in Ontario? Yeah, those are really great questions. So we're very fortunate in Ontario and Canada. So when we talk about invasive species, at least the history of invasive species, you think of something like the zebra mussel, right? Which was introduced via ballast water in the late 80s, early 90s. And they got in, they established, they started spreading, and it, once they were here, that's when people said, oh, what are these things and, and what are we gonna do about it? And that's when our program started, actually, as a result of the introduction of zero muscles. And so it was always very reactive, right? It was always, something got in, then we had to figure out what to do about it. But now, now that we've gone through those types of experiences, I like to believe that we, as Canadians and as Ontarians, have, have learned that you know, it's better to look forward and see what's coming. Right? And Asian carps are a perfect example of that. They're a species or a group of species that are not yet established in our waters that are a severe threat to our environment, our economy, and society. So we see them on the horizon and we want to stop them. Right? So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, our federal government, back in 2012, as I said, started their program. They partnered with a variety of entities and organizations in Ontario to form what's collectively called Asian Carps Canada and the Ontario Federation of Ontario Hunters is, is a part of Asian Carbs Canada. So we work with the likes of the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, we work with uh, you know, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, with the Invasive Species Centre, Federation of Ontario's Cottagers Associations, you know, you name it, there's, there's all sorts of different groups who are working collectively to educate Ontario's public about the threats of Asian carbs, and then most importantly, how to identify Asian carbs. Because you know, when you have a species that's not yet established, early detection and rapid response are key to ensuring that they don't become established, right? So when that angler catches that fish, if he knows what it is, he'll know, he or she will know to report it. And if they know to report it, then we can potentially inform government so they can get out there to remove these fish species from those waters before they have even a chance to establish themselves. And we've seen that historically, where you know the invading species hotline, the number that I gave before, uh, acted as a tool towards early detection and rapid response. And that was when 13 grass carp were actually caught in the Welland Canal, or I guess just off the Welland Canal, Lake Gibson, back in 2017. You know, phone call came into us, when it was grass carp, we notified government, they were out there a few days later, electric fishing and gill netting, and they removed 13 grass carp from the water. So it's really important that people learn how to identify and know enough to report. So as a, as a new angler, as somebody who's into fishing, making sure that you have just those basic identification skills. Uh, you know, we have lots of great resources, which, you know, if they want to contact us uh, via the hotline and ask for resources, people can do that. And we have uh, quick reference guides, all sorts of uh, resources, including our website, www.invadingspecies.com, where people can go and learn how to identify these species. So when they're on the water, they know. Perfect. Huge thank you to Brooke for coming out and doing this interview with me. And thank you to the viewer for watching. I will link all of the websites and phone numbers that were listed in the video down in the description below. If you liked the video, feel free to like, 
subscribe, and turn on the notification bell to stay in the loop about more fishing content.